You know, I believe I'm in the safest place in the state of Georgia. It's wonderful to look across this crowd, the Patriots, the Georgians, and here to celebrate the signing of this bill. But welcome to the North Georgia Mountains in LJ. What a glorious day God has given us. And I'm glad you've taken time to be here and join us and our fine governor, Nathan Deal, for this event. I give you the order of the show to get us off on the right foot. Dickon Andy McClure from the Turnertown Baptist Church will come and give us our invitation. Followed by the Chairman of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee, Chairman Alan Powell, to listen her pledge, and then a treat. For all of us, Ms. E. B. Reese will sing our national anthem. Dickon McClure. Let's bow our heads. Most kind Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this great gathering of people, Lord, that's come out, Lord, to support this event, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, for your many blessings, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for our families, our jobs, our homes. Lord, we're thankful we live in a place and in a state Lord, where our rights and freedoms are protected. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you just bless these proceedings and just be with each one that's come out this way, Lord. And may they have a safe journey home. And may we just all enjoy your fellowship today and feel your spirit. In Christ's name we humbly ask. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Rick. And I want to just give a special thanks to good people in Gilmer County and Speaker Rawson for allowing us to intrude in your beautiful backyard. You know, our friends in New York City only wish they could be beside this crowd. <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, what a great time and what a great, uh, a great opportunity for all of us to come together as friends and supporters of constitutional government. There's nothing that's more precious to us than living by what this country is all about. And if you would, <laughs> and if you would, before the speaker and the governor have an opportunity to culminate the legislative process on this most important issue of your Second Amendment rights, if you'd be kind enough to doff your hats and put your hands over your hearts, and let's say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, how sacred that is. Remove your hats for the anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming
series. Wonderful. I get to make a few remarks. A bill like this is, is a journey. A lot of people get involved, and it takes all of them. And I want to start with someone special. From the first day, Chairman Meadows and I talked about this bill. We've had the support for the most dedicated Second Amendment fellows I know. Our speaker, your representative, David Ralston. He engaged his entire staff, from Spiro Amber, to attorneys Bill Riley and Terry Chastain, Marshall Guest, who helped me with media, and our speaker, with his wise counsel, helped us lead the way. Two giants in the House are Chairman John Meadows and Chairman Alan Powell. I stood on the shoulders of these men as they helped us create and guide this bill through the process, answering thousands of emails and telephone calls. We especially, and really especially me, owe these two gentlemen a debt of thanks. Thank you. And the, re the many representatives that helped me, they counseled me, they um, covered for me, they let me whine on their shoulders, especially Mandy Ballinger, I know here today, Dusty Hightower, Chairman Jay Roberts from Osceola. The unsung heroes, there's a few of them too, is the General Assembly's Legislative Council. Uh, Julius Tolbert, Jeff Lanier, and their staff, great writing. And lastly, Senator Bill Heath. Couldn't be here today, but for carrying the spill in the Senate and doing a great job there. With the Second Amendment, it's a mere 27 words. Our founding fathers empowered the citizens of this nation for as long as it should stand to retain the right to keep and bear arms, and that right shall not be infringed. The rights enumerated by the Second Amendment speak to the importance of the preservation of a limited government and cannot be overstated. As my capacity as a state legislator, later, I'm often reminded by my constituents that their right to keep and bear arms is both sacred and immutable. It's not simply they fear the encroachment of government into their lives, it's they recognize that unfortunately we live in a dangerous world. And while I can often begin to explain the reasons for which someone might seek to take the life of another, I believe wholeheartedly that Georgians should they wish to take responsibility for the safety of themselves and their family, they should have that option. Amen. Currently our state allows Georgians 20 more years or older to have a, to have a criminal, 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 oh, I am nervous. <laughs> and mental health histories had a Georgia weapons carry license. These individuals are thoroughly vetted by both our judicial system and law enforcement agencies and are required to have a background check every five years when they renew their license. House Bill 60, the Safe Carry Protection Act, addresses the rights of this specific group of Georgians. In short, this bill is about the good guys, you guys. <laughs> and amid all of this information, in a motion that surrounds House Bill 60. One must remember that this bill is not about irresponsibly arming masses. This bill is about safety and responsibility. Georgians have and deserve the right to defend themselves, and this bill seeks to, to protect that right. Thank you. <laughs> Next we have Chairman John Badass, the Rules Chairman, and co-sponsor this bill. Hey, Gilmer County. If any rescue people welcome to North Georgia, I'll even welcome the press. I don't know why, but I will. Amendment 2, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's what this is about. I 
I carry a dog eared copy of that thing in my pocket and in my car. And my grandchildren can tell you that their Z dot does that. I'm here for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, I want to thank Rick Jaspers. Rick Jaspers is probably now the foremost authority on gun legislation there is probably in the United States. We started on this thing two and a half years ago. We got the input from the speaker and the governor. We've got a lot of people that worked hard on it. You've got a, a House and a Senate that both finally agreed after two years on the version that we can live with. The rest of my duties up here is an introduction. I have the responsibility, and it's one that I dearly love, of introducing and I think it's kind of stupid for me to introduce somebody to Gilmer County, but the Speaker of the House. I'm proud to say that the Speaker is my friend. We have been friends for a long time. When he does bad, I tell his mama on him, so it's nothing major but we get it straightened out whenever we need to. I think y'all need to understand why he is the Speaker of the House. There's 180 of us in that House, there's 56 of us in the Senate, and then we have two more gentlemen that we have to deal with. One is called the Lieutenant Governor, and the other one is the Governor sitting behind us. <laughs> there is nobody more capable nor more willing to work with not only his people that have an R beside their, name, their names, but those people that have a D and we have an occasional I. His door is open. You might not change his mind, but he will give you the opportunity. You people from Gilbert County, y'all know that. I'm talking to some of you that ain't from here. I like that word, ain't <laughs> I'm fixing the F-I-X-I-N to tell you something else, too. <laughs> I think that it is probably the most important election that we in the House have seen in five years. You have the opportunity as voters of this district to return the man that's represented you for years in the Senate and in the House. A man who is not much of a politician. Not much of a politician. But he's one hell of a statesman. My friend, David Rolston. Thank you, John Meadows, for that uh, kind introduction, and I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to come here today on what is a very, very beautiful day. I'm honored to welcome those of you who are not from Gilmer County to LJ and Gilmer County and to the 7th House District. This is the uh, Apple capital of Georgia. And yes, it is a community where we cling to religion and guns. And so we're here today to have a, um, a celebration. I want to, before I take just a minute to talk about today, I want to thank some people who, are, who have worked very, very hard today. You know, um, we were just talking out there. I don't know that I... I know. I've never been to a bill signing with this many people before. Um, and uh, so uh, I think that's, that's, that's pretty cool. 
and the people of Georgia owe Rick a great debt of gratitude and I owe him a great debt of gratitude and thank Rick Jaspers very, very much. And all these House members that have come from all over the state today, uh, I'm Representative Stover from Coweta County and Representative Dunahoo from Hall County and Representative Hightower from Douglas County and Representative Rogers from Habersham County and Representative Barr from Gwinnett County and Ballinger from Cherokee County, Pizzo from Columbus, Muskogee County, Duncan from Forsyth County, Hitchens, all the way from Effingham County. I won't tell them where your weekend place is. <laughs> He's a smart man, though. Representative Tanner from Dawson County. Did I miss anybody? Other former members I know are here. But these members all uh, were co-sponsors and worked very hard on that, and I am grateful for all of them for standing strong for two years and working very, very hard to make sure that this bill was passed. Georgians can know today that we take our rights under the Constitution very seriously. And you can know. You know, I sometimes wonder, especially during the heat of an election campaign, you know, I think we all do sometimes, why we do this job. Um, and this is not in my comments, but um, um, a lady stopped me as I came in and she said, you know, I'm 60 years old, and I just wanted to come here today and say thank you. I just got my concealed carry permit because of the Meredith Emerson case, because I hike. And I wanted to be here today to say thank you. And... Uh, know that this job is worth doing. And I want you to know that as long as I'm honored to serve as a speaker in this state, that there's no law-abiding Georgian will ever have to run and hide from a bad guy. I have the um, great honor today of introducing our very special guest, and he also needs no introduction. He's a neighbor here in North Georgia who has been a leader at every level in our state. He represented this community in North Georgia in the U.S. House of Representatives for 18 years where he was a strong defender of the Second Amendment. In 2010, he was elected Georgia's governor. And as governor, he has been a tireless champion of job creation and economic development and of moving Georgia forward. 235,000 new jobs in the private sector in the last four years. A strong advocate for educational reform and criminal justice reform the leader of a state that is now rated the number one state in the nation in which to do business. He's the quarterback of a great team that we have in state government. He's a great partner and I am proud to call him my friend. He is a man of character and integrity who seeks to be judged by his deeds and not by words or rhetoric. And without his support, this bill would not have become law. We are honored that he came to LJ today for this historic occasion. And I hope you will join me in welcoming to the podium now the Governor of Georgia, Governor Nathan Deal. Distinguished uh, platform guests and speakers, 
What a great day to be in North Georgia. What a great day to reaffirm our liberties. We as Georgians believe in the right of the people to defend themselves and therefore we believe in the Second Amendment. Throughout my career as a legislator I have voted for and as governor I have signed legislation that protects the rights to keep and bear arms. It is a right that is ingrained in the very fabric of our nation. Yet the inheritance of a right does not preclude the need for vigilance by succeeding generations. Thomas Jefferson told the world in the Declaration of Independence that we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. He believed in the right to bear arms. He said, and I quote, the strongest reason for the people to retain the right to keep and bear arms as a last resort is to protect themselves against the tyranny in government. But, but Jefferson also said this, that each generation of Americans must make its own way, saying that, and I quote, one generation has no more right to bind another to its laws and judgments than one independent nation has the right to command another. So today, our generation reiterates the desire for this fundamental right for our own reasons. While we still guard against tyranny, America today cherishes this right so that people who follow the rules can protect themselves and their families from those who don't follow the rules. The General Assembly during this past legislative session passed this piece of bipartisan legislation by large margins that extends the protections for Georgians who have gone through a background check to legally obtain a Georgia weapons carry license. House Bill 60 will protect law-abiding citizens by expanding the number of places that they can carry their guns without penalty. At the same time, this bill respects the rights of private property owners who still set the rules for their lands and their buildings. The various parts of House Bill 60 do much to expand the rights of gun owners who are licensed to carry, but it also expands the rights of those who serve our nation in uniform. One exemplary part of this bill for instance, gives our military men and women, 18 and older, permission to carry, uh, to, to obtain a license to carry. You know, if they're old enough to hold a gun in defense of our liberties, they are old enough to hold a gun, and they shouldn't have to wait until they're 21. I want to thank uh, Speaker Ralston, Representative Jaspers, Meadows, and uh, the others who have supported this legislation, have shepherded it through uh, this session of the General Assembly, and who worked to pass it on a bipartisan uh, basis. The Second Amendment should never be an afterthought. It should reside at the forefront of our minds as we craft, pass, and sign laws. Our state has some of the best protections for gun owners in the United States, and today we strengthen those rights guaranteed by our country's most revered founding document. My position on this bill should not come as much of a surprise. I think my track record speaks for itself. The NRA gave me an A rating throughout my more than 17 years as a member of Congress and even endorsed me when I ran for this present office of governor. Now as governor, I have signed every Second Amendment piece of legislation that has been placed on my desk. And today, I will put into law a gun bill that heralds 
self-defense, personal liberties, and public safety. Now, we're going to take questions from you, and I'm going to ask uh, all of these members of the General Assembly who are seated on the stage behind me if they will come to the platform, and uh, we will entertain your questions at this time. Mr. Speaker, would you and the others join? Governor Deal, one of the things that we're hearing in this room here is a lot of folks in this room would like to see the principles in this bill applied to the state capitol. Why not allow folks to carry guns in the state capitol? Well, uh, for one thing, we have metal detectors at the state capitol. And there is an exemption that is carved out for those public buildings that provide uh, for that type of internal security by metal detectors. Anybody like to comment on that? Governor, why not allow folks to carry permits to go through the metal detectors with their weapons? Well, because that is a carved out area, and it's a uniform carved out area uh, all across our state. Is it consistent to allow guns in the county courthouses and not allow them in the county? Well, the county courthouses have the right to exclude them as well. If they have metal detectors there, which increasingly more county courthouses do have that. Governor, uh, can you talk a little bit about some concerns from uh, municipal leaders uh, that this extra security is going to place an undue cost burden? Um, in order to put in some of these security measures at these local buildings? Well, let me ask uh, some of the members who stand behind me because I know they have talked with uh, those uh, local officials, and I know uh, Rick Jaspers has, and I'm sure Chairman Meadows, as a former mayor, has had those conversations with his former colleagues. I think it's their choice. I think the nice thing about this bill is it does give them the option. But I think in this room, when you think about it, our county government should not be afraid of the honest citizens who do have a license who are here today. Yeah. Those that have a license, it's very clear in those areas that that person there with the weapon would have to have a permit. Governor, Governor, the law enforcement has uh, voiced concerns about not being able to approach people just to check their permits if they are openly carrying. Can you respond to that? Well, I know that there's been that question been addressed to the committee and the uh, individual to handle it. Let me, uh, let me ask our public safety fellow here. Thank you, Governor. There's only been one sheriff that has expressed any amount of concern about that, and the reason the language was drafted in the bill, that there's been a Supreme Court decision that said that law enforcement cannot use your right to ask you if you have a concealed weapon permit as probable cause to basically check you out. And that's how it was drafted. So just by the virtue of having a concealed weapons permit doesn't give probable cause. You got to be In this day and time, there's obviously something that comes out of the federal courts that are good. And that was one of them. So that the noble zealous of the government can't use that as a purpose. Governor, do you agree with that, that the police should be able to approach a person with an open carry to check the permits? I think the court has clarified it, as uh, Chairman Powell has already indicated. Governor, we've heard from several law enforcement officials who have said that they could... I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Uh, we've heard from several law enforcement officials who have said that they could lead to more uh, lawsuits and even some more bloodshed that that provision we're talking about. Are you concerned about that? Well, I, I certainly respect the opinion of law enforcement officers. I have not had that ex opinion expressed to me. Um, maybe some of you would like to comment on it. Governor, you yes. expressed some concerns early on about campus carry. Why reservations on your, from your part on the campus carry provision? Well, I thought that uh, that was one of the areas that uh, did need further clarification and further study. Um, and it was decided that that part was omitted as it was originally submitted at one point in time. Um, I think the bill, uh, by having that left out, probably avoided much of the controversy that might have been associated with that one particular issue, and I think facilitated the overall bill being passed. Governor, he yeah. said earlier that the county and people should not be afraid of the permit carrying uh, citizens, then why limit us from not being allowed to go into buildings that have metal detectors? Well, I didn't draft that legislation, so let me ask uh, those who did uh, that specific question, and I understand there's an argument on the part of those that, that you should go anywhere without regard uh, to metal detectors or no metal detectors. Uh, but those facilities 
where those metal detectors are have been the judgment call of local officials where they felt that scrutiny was more appropriate. Uh, any of you like to respond on that one? Thank you, Governor. You know, one of the things that we've always carved out, and that's been courtrooms, because of the emotional, uh, the emotional things that transact in a court of law or in the courtroom itself. And quite frankly, that was one of the reasons that the, a lot of the people who would support or would not support anything to allow them to come in, we have, we are at a heightened level of security at the state capitol. And you know, that's quite frankly the reason that it wasn't included. Now, some of us aren't afraid of that. Because some of us can shoot back. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, the members of the job. Okay, one last question. I'm sorry, have you had any uh, conversations with local school officials um, who might be interested in moving forward with this plan and allowing some of their employees to obtain weapons? Or I have not personally had those conversations. Uh, I have uh, been told that there are local officials within our school systems who are perhaps interested in taking advantage of the opportunities that are afforded uh, for them to select uh, trained individuals uh, within either their staff or faculty uh, that they choose. And I think that is, once again, an appropriate local decision. They know the circumstances much better than any of us do, and it's very difficult to write a state statute that applies to everybody's individual circumstance, it is much better to give them the leeway to make those judgment calls. That's what the legislation does. Father, to understand the love that we should have for you, the love that we should have for our country, and the love, and Father, the respect that we should have for our fellow man. We give thanks for our governor, for the speaker, for these ladies and gentlemen who represent our state so well. And Father, we pray that you'll bless them this day. We ask, Father, that you would help each of us to count our blessings and give you thanks each and every day. Bless the food we're about to enjoy. Be with us as we travel to our homes. In your son's name we ask. Amen. Thank all of you for being here. Barbecue is being served in the back.